Hello everyone, I'm Nikolai Foss. I'm a professor of strategy at the Copenhagen Business School. And I've been asked by the nice people in the Behavioral Strategy Interest Group in Strategic Management Society to uh, reflect a bit on what um, or how behavioral strategy research ideas can inform firms and decision makers on coping with a disrupted and disruptive world. Uh, it, it's clear, of course, that we are currently witnessing uh, truly massive disruption, some of which was caused by behavioral responses to the threat of the COVID-19 virus itself, and some of which has been caused by governments uh, reacting to the pandemic by locking down substantial parts of the economy. Now, this major, truly major disruption provides one example after another of basic behavioral strategy ideas. So if we, if we go back to the beginning of the onset of the crisis, mid to late February, beginning of March, decision making in those days was very much about sense making. Sense making under high level of ambiguity and under deep uncertainty. So it was about unstructured decision making, to use Henry Mintzberg's term, and the absence of a predetermined set of ordered responses. Uh, or at least this was the case in the Western part of the world where decision makers, it's fair to say, were very much uh, caught by surprise. Uh, some decision makers elsewhere in the world were, however, very much able to engage in rapid and correct sense making based on their previous or prior experience. So Taiwan was able to move quickly and successfully because Taiwanese decision makers read the signals coming from China correctly uh, and they were able to do this based on their earlier experience with similar illnesses. So this is like, th th these are basically behavioral theory of the firm ideas, which you could argue is part of the behavioral strategy tradition. Um, along the same lines we, uh, of reasoning, we, we saw coalitions, uh, dominant coalitions arising between politicians, business leaders and experts, the media in some cases, forming, becoming stronger. Uh, we, we witnessed a little bit of infighting occasionally within those coalitions, such as in Denmark, and I think we are witnessing increasingly the breakup of those coalitions, so the, the, the breakup of organizational chooses. Uh, we have observed much of the biased decision-making resulting from the more or less automatic application of heuristics to decision situations that the heuristics and biases literature of the whole Kahneman and Tversky tradition uh, uh, tells us about. If we, if we look for them, it's easy to find examples of retrieval biases, confirmation biases, uh, flawed reference points, escalating commitments, excessive threat responses, and so on. We, we have seen that, uh, as Jim Martin and Sua Shapira tells us, tell us that decision makers' preferences are very clearly situationally dependent. So, for example, policymakers very strongly increased the revealed valuation of lost lives during the crisis, or at least those lives that may be lost as a result of the virus. We have witnessed, I think, pretty massive expert failure. Uh, quite a humbling experience, I, I think, uh, such as some projections of the number of deaths from, from the virus that were just wildly off the mark. We've also witnessed massive regulatory failure, such as, or, or even a government failure, such as the, the failure to keep the virus out of the homes of the old and vulnerable. Uh, the, the latter cases may not, or the latter examples may not strictly be behavioral strategy examples, but they, they, they indicate the limitations of models in the service of decision making when things are highly ambiguous or very uncertainty. And they underline the importance of judgment, decision-making in the absence of formal models in such 
situations. We've always we have also witnessed, uh, I think, massive groupthink as uh, faulty modern projections, media sensationalism, and politician politicians who assumed uh, worst case scenarios jointly stirred up massive fear in the public at large. These are just a few examples of of things in the in the um, in the, in the current crisis that we can easily interpret or relate to behavioral strategy research. There's a lot more, I think, if you look for it. And I think that someone should write up a behavioral strategy interpretation of the whole COVID disruption. It will probably be a monograph length treatment, but you know, maybe a, maybe an article is feasible. Uh, and for, 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 for the scholar who, who will try his or her hand at this. There's a great source of inspiration available in literature. I have in mind a paper by Michael Jacobides from 2007, which was published in Organization Science. And Michael studies how Turkey and Greece almost went to war back in 1996. And he studies this whole episode through basically a behavioral strategy lens. So I think we, we, we can use behavioral strategy principles to make sense out of decision making in the crisis. But the disruption also points to some areas where behavioral strategy research isn't particularly strong. And there are a couple of or three of, of, the, of, of such areas. So the first one, if, if we consider strategic decision making, where does decision making that is aided by formal models, rules, forecasts, even determined by such formal models, rules and forecasts, where does that end? And where does decision making in the absence of such models and so on, what we might call judgment, where does that begin? Second point, the disruption reminds us very strongly, I think, that strategy making does not take place in a vacuum, but is a deeply social process. For example, what we saw in the COVID crisis was that early reference points, such as you know, excessive estimates of fatality rates, uh, excessive uh, mortality forecasts, very vivid footage from Chinese hospitals, footage of those trucks coming out of Bergamo and so on. These reference points influenced information gathering and decision making, arguably in a not wholly optimal way which may have been compounded by a poor risk literacy among decision makers as well as the, the public at large. So how do decision makers avoid relying too strongly, perhaps, on those very vivid, forceful reference points that are imposed by, by the social environment? The third point has to do with moving from a situation of uncertainty to risk, because I, I think this is what has been going on over the last two to three months. So initially we had decision making under very deep uncertainty and a high level of ambiguity, but the epistemic funnel, if you like, has narrowed so that uncertainties are increasingly being transformed into risks. Now this is not a natural process per se, this is also a social, even political process. Uh, influenced by prevailing beliefs, institutions, coalitions, and so on. How do, what can we say about this process and how can we best manage it? On this latter point, uh, Timo Erik and I uh, offer a few reflections in a recent small piece that was pu published on May the 4th by Quillette. It's called Risk, Uncertainty, and COVID-19 strategies. It should be easy to find if you Google it, risk, uncertainty, COVID-19 strategies. This concludes my reflections. Thanks very much for your time.